Yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great pleasure to have both of you um, with your own names to the Northeast to engage in a debate about not just the human condition, but also the nature of state formation. Because the state is there, because the state has to be there for ordinary people to produce conditions in which life can be safe and in so far as one can define what good is, good can be realized. So I'm making a distinction between state formation and the human condition. And the Lockean. And then I'll bring in Rousseau because we are also talking about the community sometimes supplementing Hobbes and Locke, but also sometimes trying to replace them and become everything in one. But under conditions of Locke. <laughs> OK. The second point I'd like to make is, is this a peculiarly Indian problem? Isn't it the case that Sri Lanka has Elam, Pakistan has Fata, and Bangladesh has Chittagong Hill tracts? So all South Asian states, in a manner of speaking, share a problematic so that there's an opportunity to do some comparative work on which South Asian state does how much for state formation and community building. Here, I would, <laughs> if I had Shakespeare in the room, he would uh, have me for plagiarism. But I would say, I'm here. No, we are here to bury Caesar, but not to praise him. But Caesar was an honorable man like in Julius Caesar, isn't the Indian state also to be recognized for Article 371, 371A, B, C, and so on, for providing very peculiar special tribal rights and not pulverizing differences, but trying to accommodate them. The fact that the Butalias of the World Project, the Northeast, also goes to show how much the Indian civil society is receptive to the needs for community. I stop here by asking one last question. Prognosis. What is the choice for very small, distinctly different nationalities in the world, in the post 9-11 world, in terms of becoming or not becoming the kind of independent state they would want to be? Remember FISO, all those years of long struggle, is this ultimately about a negativity? That generation after generation, one holds on to something which is not to be. Shouldn't we rather vote with those 200,000 in Delhi, 250,000 in Bangalore, not East young men and women who are stretching out to find their futures there or elsewhere while holding on to their homeland? So isn't that? likely also to be another alternative rather than the total negation of the Indian state. <laughs> well, uh, look, I, I, as I said, I'm, I'm just, it's a reflective piece. I, I really can't say very much, uh, except that, you know, uh, say things like uh, uh, Article 371, etc. I was very struck by the Article 371A there's a political theorist called, uh, called uh, Rajiv uh, Bhargav, who has a positive reading. I had a fairly positive reading. Then I was reading B.K. Nehru's autobiography when he was governor. He reads Article 370A. Nagaland is a special charge because law and order is with the government, with the governor. <laughs> so his reading is very different. He says, I was very busy in Nagaland because law and order is in my charge, according to Article 371A. So what I'm saying is that these things are more complicated. Uh, so that, after all, that's why I'm basically saying the reason I'm putting so much burden on this panic politics is that not enough thinking has gone into all of this, even Article 371. What right? Essentially, my, my, my thinking is that Northeast India was for historical, kind of political, geog colonial geography reasons. You know, just think of, you know, inner line, this line, that line, permanent, right? It was such a mess. In some ways, there has been no post-colonial thinking. Article 3, the uh, Constitution is just uh, repeats the uh, uh, Act of 1935. No, 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 imagination there. The words are changed. 
right? Excluded area becomes something else, six schedule. So actually, all I'm saying is that it'll, it requires an enormous intellectual investment to figure out. That was never done. The Constitution didn't do it, and then boom, the 71 Act, all of that was really panic politics after the China War. That's the trouble, right? These things are possibilities, I agree with you. But if you look at the rush in which they are making and the fact that many of the small people protesting that we see is, I argue, partly the function of this, you know, this, uh, essentially, look, no, I'm not saying 1971 invented it. The colonial geography was, you will be amazed, it is really a kind of bio-ethnic notion of a peculiar racial, racial notion that colonials had. You know, they have said the word like, you know, Nagas live here, Mizus live here, they don't live there. Uh, you know, the Khasis live in the hills, Khasis don't live in the plains. You know, this is almost like a naturalized view, which is so racial. All of those was deeply troubling notions, if you like. Right? If you look at the Khasi trading business, they're all in the plains of, ba of Bangladesh. So all of this began there. But rather than thinking originally after colonial rule, we simply kept all of it. Just gave it some nice words. And, and you know, inner, inner line, Bodhisattva Kora historian thinks of the inner line. He says, you know, the tea was here, and then all that potential trouble for tree were trying to fencing it off. So the whole colonial kind of a territorialization, it was a dangerous business. We've kept all of it, right? So no thinking has gone into it. That's the trouble. So 371, you can give a positive interpretation, but if you look at all of this history, it gets hard. So I would say a lot of the mess in Northeast political imagination. It is both as if you, if you can't think of rights and autonomy without the idea of an ethnic, ethnic homeland, and, and there is a reason for that, it's not just imagination. There's a whole the distinction in colonial times where common law and customary law. Customary law allows you to say, no outsider belongs here. All of those, right? Because a customary, right? Uh, so that, and it's very complicated. So the real tension between political economy, the real political economy, and the kind of a dispolitical economy of the primitive. And all of that is still our kind of a ethnic homeland. You see? So, the, so in that sense, I would say uh, that the possibility, so, uh, so under, that's what I mean by unless we desecuritize our imagination, by which I simply mean really confront this set of mistakes and problems. I don't see an easy way out. That's all I'm saying at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, incidentally, by the way, uh, this is uh, the honorable man, uh, Mark Antony said, was Brutus, rather than Caesar, who actually killed Caesar and, and you know, killed the state, so to say. Uh, Mike uh, was <laughs> very East Indian. <laughs> Sorry to <laughs> say. <laughs> Have I got it right? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, it was, <laughs> Brutus was the honorable man. Anyway. Uh, also, apart from the two of you, uh, myself and Dimkin are probably the only others in this room who were born in the Northeast. No, Northeast. Uh, no, no, there are more people, I see. <laughs> more claims. <laughs> more claims, more claims, which is called uh, by some uh, the, uh, the West Southeast Asia. West Southeast Asia. Now, uh, you mentioned Olaf Karu, of course. Uh, uh, one interesting thing about Olaf Karu is. Uh, he was also governor of the frontier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So he, he took the frontiers yeah. of yeah, India yeah, yeah. and sort of sought to indigenize uh, the tribes, so mm -hmm. to say, mm -hmm. as buffers between, between right. uh, the rest of this thing and, and India. Mm -hmm. So Karu, interestingly, I mean, uh, uh, sought to introduce similar policies in in the Northeast as he had done, as he uh, did later in the. In the Right, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is about this uh, uh, look in the uh, Act India and, mm -hmm. and the sort of the political mm -hmm. integration with India in right. the Shiliguri right. uh, 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 mm -hmm. or uh, uh, chicken, 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 neck. chicken neck. On the one hand, mm -hmm. if you are going to integrate with, with Southeast Asia, right. you are dealing mm -hmm. Northeast from India. Right. You see? Mm -hmm. and you also not uh, you don't have an easy task because uh, you, you you're not facing uh, Southeast Asia you are facing Burma, Burma really. okay. uh, and and that is difficult yeah, absolutely. Uh, that delivers you from Southeast Asia yeah. as well uh -huh. yeah. and already you have uh, tribes like the Nagas you mentioned Fizo a couple of times right, right. but you didn't mention Kapla right right this and is the Kaplan yeah, is the yeah. uh, this yeah. is the yeah. current uh, yeah. Yeah. problem and uh, the whole issue of uh, what they call the People's Republic of uh, Naga, uh, Nagalim. Nagalim, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, in Nagalim. So there is a sort of transboundary mm -hmm. uh, insurgency developed. Right. 
Now, is this making it much lot uh, harder for this region to be integrated politically, economically, and emotionally with the rest of India? Well, you know, it was interesting to me. I actually was involved in uh, very seriously in the Lukis policies initial stages, not in the policy making role. I had a little center in Guwahati where people like Willem came and spoke, whose entire goal was really that uh, North East India should, be, should have a place in the Lukis policy, right? And I'm a little disillusioned, I must say, looking back now. That was ten years ago. So, uh, so that uh, for so uh, number of reasons, I, I think in the India, partly because of the Burma issues, the Burma dilemma, if you like, right? You have this wonderful imagination that North East India is gateway to Southeast Asia, it next isn't. to next to Singapore, yeah. but it's actually next to Burma, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that poses a very major problem, and that's sort of a dozen people don't people think of it enough. And obviously, the Burma is producing huge issues. If you look at, for instance, even the Indian security types are constantly back and forth. If you see that they try to build the road, and then there is a reservation about building the road, right? All of that is exactly reflecting what you're saying. But even when they have something, see, I was very struck by the fact that they had the uh, gate, uh, the, the car rally. So car rally, right? So in a way that I would say, these kind of a little groups control space so much. In Manipur, when the car rally happened, there was a, going to be a strike, car rally won't be allowed. You essentially then you had this military type met one of those small groups, had a deal with him, gave him some money, and the car really happened. So clearly the state doesn't control these spaces, right? So in the sense that the uncertainties are huge, you're absolutely right, right? And so that the government itself is going back and forth. And and I would say if you go to for instance in uh, in the in the Moray, the the the, the, the mountain, uh, sorry, the, the border town, so there was a huge opening of the place where the legal trade to take place. So that there was enormous hope that there'll be the kind of enormous kind of expansion of trade, and all the I think what the, what Burma did, they suddenly have this Nampalong kind of a market they open. It's called the Nampalong market. So essentially, that the whole moray happened, but the effect of moray is all kinds of Chinese goods coming into India, <laughs> right? So that was not the intention, if you like, right? <laughs> but, but because on the other hand, the demand is huge. So, I, so you can see, right, if you're Indian, making Indian policy, that's not why you build more uh, this trading station. Actually, more Chinese goods are coming in, right? So in a sense, there's a huge kind of a problem, the, the Burma problem, let's put it, right? So it's not clear. There's enormous kind of a investment here and there, but I, can, I see constantly back and forth, and even on the China, on the Nagaland question. You have an, a, 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 an August 15th, enormous uh, enthusiasm, the Naga settlement is happening, and because of Kaplong after that, you have the military intelligence type talking about having boundaries so that Naga rebels can come in. So, that's an amb ambivalence, yeah. That's all I say at the moment. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, <coughs> uh, Brutus was an honorable man, even though he killed Caesar. <laughs> Another Eastern Indian. <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm fairly an ignoramus, and uh, but I I'm, I'm just wondering uh, your response to would you would you would you say that chief ministers like Nripen Chakraborty in Tripura, mm -hmm. who have performed you know much better panchayat right. than perhaps even in West Bengal in uh -huh. the heydays, uh -huh. uh, along with some stellar very committed pro-poor bureaucrats like Shankaran right, right. Uh, have produced real transformations that are not by the bullet. Uh -huh. And therefore, there are, there are probably cases uh -huh. of experiments within Indian democracy where uh -huh. uh, even the lack of bullet has produced more security for people who are considered outsiders and insiders. Right. Or do you disagree with this assessment of uh, the political, economic, and social handling of a state like Tripura? Well, I essentially was happy, you know, sometimes the whole exception proves the rule kind of issue involved there. You see, the fact that Tripura is relatively peaceful, the other side of it is that Tripura's demographic transformation is complete. Bengali Hindus after refugees is the face of Tripura, right? So is that, so in the sense that it's a, it produces an interesting problem, that peace happens when you can have a closure on that conquest. If you consider the rest of North East India, the problem is always migration. Two places which are relatively peaceful is Sikkim, where Nepali immigrants dominate, and Tripura, where Bengali Hindus dominate. So that is obviously makes you think, is that the formula needed for peace? Is that formula possible in Assam? 
obviously not. Is that formula possible in the Nagaland? No. So in that sense, I would say Tripura raises more troubling questions than anything else to me, right? Because peace happens only when the demographic question is settled. Becomes, it becomes a frontier, complete frontier, successful frontier, like the US, Australia, like New Manchuria. Zealand, Manchuria. So these are the peaceful spots. So I'm, I'll hesitate to think of it as a model at the moment. Okay. Um, two questions, if I may, and sure. both allude to how the ground realities and perceptions have uh, changed over the last quarter of a century, as so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, to draw upon Professor Dwarah's early comments about the relationship between the Manchu and the Han, if you look closer to Southeast Asia, just across the border from Nagaland, for instance, uh, it's been a very fractured relationship between the Burmans and the Kareni, the Karen, the Shan, yeah, right. and other tribes. Mm -hmm. It's not been static, however. And, and if you go further east, it's with the Hmong in Laos and right. uh, Cambodia's got, not Cambodia so much, but Vietnam has mm -hmm. its mm -hmm. issues with the northern tribes. Mm -hmm. With the passage of time, the expansion of the market economy, and even simple things like development of roads and right. electricity, right. That has changed. Sure. The more sure. is, the perceptions mm -hmm. have changed right, right, right. as well. So the first question is, do you see any of that happening? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Secondly, given how, I mean, we grew up thinking of the West as a paragon mm -hmm. of growth and, the, and right, right. development, but in the 90s, I mean, the since the 90s, the last 30 years, the most right. remarkable growth has been in Southeast Asia and then right. later in right. China. Right. The cow belt, I'm sorry, the north, northern India had a very particular perception of how, and right, uh, I mean, right. it's, it's, it's known to all of us, I won't repeat right, the, right. some of the very unpleasant language that was uh -huh. used. Right. Now with the openness, more information, you know, right. China is a paragon of growth, I mean, people right. full of admiration for right. what's happening in Southeast Asia. Yeah. And given the fact that how the Northeast was very often seen as the other, right. more closely tied to these areas, are you seeing any changes at yeah. you know, the ground level yeah. in Look, perceptions in mores and a huge capital a huge <laughs> huge changes you know uh, Look, as you know, I'm, I'm also aware that social science or our current inquiries cannot answer certain questions. Now the fact that you know uh, you have say highways and roads completely changing landscapes, imagination, right? In a way, I would, it'll be hard to say what is the result of all of that. That's one. The other, though, in terms of the, I don't want to be kind of a, uh, I, I, I think I also want to recognize the importance of thinking outside the developmental imaginary, by which I mean this. I was looking at, in the, in the context of this, all this, my thinking, say, um, in uh, 1870 to 1900, Assam's growth rate was so fantastic. It was unbelievable that when Lord Curzon came to Assam in 1900, he called it the empire's most enterprising and promising <coughs> corner. 90, so 1870 to 1900, enormous expansion of tea, enormous coal, oil development. And so the story is captured by an economic historian, Amalindu Guha, uh, in his famous article called The Big Push Without a Takeoff. Right, it's a classic kind of a dependency theory kind of an argument. So I, t so what happens from about 1990s till about now? There's an enormous in investment in Northeast India, unbelievable amounts, right? So that there's more money going into Northeast India according to some calculations than Bangladesh's total foreign aid, right? So obviously something is happening, road building, this that, right? So am, am I? Can I say what's go what's going to was the result of all of that? In some ways, I'm a little reluctant to, to just stay within the imaginary for a number of reasons. But if you stay with it, but still, when I look at it, though, I find some, some things fascinating, that exactly when in the rest of India, poverty rate goes down, it doesn't go down in Northeast India, exactly when there is so much investment. Something interesting going on there, right? So obviously, so, so my, I have a piece, working piece, which I call another big push without a takeoff, <laughs> right? So but yes, road building is happening. What will road building do? even Lukey's policy. I am more impressed by the fact that Lukey's policy is changing imagination so much that Ulfa thinks about Burma, <laughs> right? There are all unpredictable things about Lukey's policy, right? It is, you will be amazed by how it is changing imagination. People probably, again, probably people think their children can go to Singapore, this, that. That's not official policy's imagination. But, uh, but I'm simply saying that what capitalism does is too hard to predict in terms of all these issues. The issues may become irrelevant. 
right? You have the change of that sort. But then on the other hand, do we stop there and say, well, you know, that the, because after all we know, for instance, if you, the, the, our dam building, I did, did some time on dam building. I'm quite convinced, for instance, dam building, dam, I'm nothing against dams, but the kind of dam building we're doing in Arunachal is really a hydropower with a vengeance, no other purpose, no flood, nothing. It's only turning over rivers to capitalists for to produce hydropower. So is that, and then I'm quite sure what somebody calls slow violence. What it means is that if you, if you travel to Bangladesh, Assam, you know, during the monsoon season, people are fishing all kinds of ways. And if you, you don't need data for it to realize that that fish is the source of huge protein for lots of poor people. No engineer has told me fish will survive these dams. So clearly I see the slow violence. I see huge numbers of people disappearing. There are all livelihood not being viable anymore. So massive changes are happening, I have no doubt. What do you call it? Nation building? Do you call it development? Do you call it progress? I'm not sure. Can I just ask sure, a, sure. a little question on this? Uh, why don't you, your, your notion of sovereignty outsourcing, because where there is a lot of investment, uh -huh. and there's this whole logic that mm -hmm. you have tried to also depict, right. like Iraq, right. these are war towns, these right. are participants, uh -huh. right? It's very hard to translate capital there into so, you know, uh -huh. which comes first? What is the, you know, uh -huh. is it going to get into the logic of this? Oh, that's also interesting. Uh, so, that's yeah. also, I think, something. Sure, no, I agree. I have none that, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay, uh, uh, Ganesh and then Katalesh. Uh, you know, I just wanted to, I was very, in, very interested in what you said about the 1960s. And, um, you know, I from what I gathered, uh, 1960s is a very critical period. Mm -hmm. in the way constructions of Northeast right. change. Right. So you mentioned, and I'm very interested in the 1971 uh, events. Right. So, you know, is there, and of course, as you put your finger on this, by saying that no investment in knowledge happens, mm -hmm. and there is that mm -hmm. change from the old framework of Assam mm -hmm. as the anchor state. Right. And then you have suddenly these new states which are created, right. Right. Uh, very suddenly, and right. even people are, mm -hmm. Uh, surprised in the northeast. So, yeah. is there any good work? Are you really looking more deeply at that? And so, this is one question I have. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question is, you know, I was hoping to hear more about the effects of 1962 mm -hmm. on the whole region and this whole securitization of yeah. the discourse. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, so, isn't this uh, creation of these new states? Uh -huh. Related to external events, the 62 war, sure. 65 war, right. the 71, uh -huh. in some ways, the anticipation of 71. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I would, uh, mm -hmm. in some ways, what I'm saying is that I would be happy if there is more, if you historicize the 60s a little bit more. No, I agree. Of course, look, yeah. Uh, no, I, I, look, I haven't done it. I haven't done it, and I, I can't say mm -hmm. even the historicizing itself requires a particular imagination. So other scholars haven't done it either, right? So I'm just identifying it as a problem area at the moment. Uh, and so 71 becomes very interesting, right? After all, uh, 71 Delhi face uh, based, based thinking of 71 will be, finally, we don't have the Pakistan problem. On the other hand, 71 exactly exacerbates Assam's so-called foreigner problem, right? So on a way that, that completely disappears in, in, in from Delhi's horizon, right? So one can argue actually 71 makes things worse from, for, for Northeast and better for, for from Delhi, right? To the extent that Pakistan problem changes today, right? So, so, so it's tricky. So the fact that Northeast has never featured as a major thing to be, uh, to be addressed Whereas I feel more than any other part of India, that's the area needed most intellectual attention. Intellectual. Just how do you really make, uh, you know, the colonial geography was so messy, I keep saying. You require a lot of, uh, how do you make it part of a normal national space? I'm not saying it's a bad project, it's a good project. But you can't just do it, right? So after all, think about colonial geography, think about, you know, Nepal, the fact that Nepal and India has an has a open border. All of that is colonial geography, right? I'm not saying that it's a bad thing, but not so the open border continues not because somebody thought great, let's th thought it through. No, no thinking, it's continuing. So you have this whole colonial geography continuing without uh, without much thought, and there northeast problems becomes the problem becomes sharpest. So in some ways, northeast is not different from northwest frontier province, right? But we never make that equation. Because the kind of conflicts are so different, Northwest Frontier Province become big because you have Taliban, Taliban, Afghanistan, right? But if you just simply think about the fact that 
their colonial geography's legacy is Taliban Afghanistan Northwest Frontier Province. Then Northeast and Northwest looks more alike than different, right? And, on, and you can't address it without really intellectually taking on the project of how do you decolonize space. We haven't done it. Uh, thank, thank you very much for your presentation. And as someone who also works on Pakistan, I completely agree that there's a lovely comparative project there looking yes. at Fatah mm -hmm. and uh, the northeast of India. Uh -huh. um, I was very struck by your comment on the territorialization of ethnicity because in my other work, I work on ethno-federalism, the idea that conceding autonomy to um, groups who are concentrated in a space actually makes them more secure within a state, it makes them more likely or right. less likely to be secessionist, uh -huh. more likely to create dual identities. Uh -huh. Now of course the reason I've spent my entire career avoiding working on the North East is because right. the North East doesn't neatly mm -hmm. fit into that. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons, as a couple of people have um, alluded to and you yourself have said, is that you know you've got you've got this incredible diversity. So Tripura is fine because Bengali Hindus um, dominate. You can't replicate that um, in Assam. And there's a lot of evidence, even with people who work on ethno-federalism, that you need to have a certain size of a majority group for them to feel secure enough not to then actually repress the minorities right. within the areas, which is the other point uh -huh. you made. Uh -huh. Now, I presented a paper in Hyderabad earlier this year, and I was doing, you know, kind of like the center state relations, looking at the problems with the Northeast, mm -hmm. New Delhi's policies, et cetera, et cetera, you know, mm -hmm. foreign investment and mm -hmm. government investment, mm -hmm. and got completely taken to task for saying, this is not a center state issue. What you really need to be looking at is whether it's like an intrastate issue and all these um, kind of tensions internal to the Northeast. Mm -hmm. That's where you should really be looking at. I guess my question to you is, is it possible to separate the two? Or are they part of a, a whole bigger picture? Separate interstate from center state. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. Did you say interstate or intrastate? Intrastate. Yeah. I-N-T-R. Could, could, could I join in here? I mean, I have a question uh, to join in with Catherine. I did a survey uh, in 2009 on citizenship in India. One of the uh, four questions to measure citizenship was, do you consider yourself a citizen of India? And we were ranking the Indian states on the basis of this question. Guess who came tops? in terms of not a citizen of India. It was not Kashmir. Kashmir was number two. It was Tripura. And I had never been to Tripura, so I thought, I'll go and check it out. And I was a guest of uh, the Chief Minister, Nirpan Chakraborty. Superb six-lane highways, a superb all empty. Superb multi-story secretariat, all empty as you're going up. On the left, you hear Fur Elisa and all this claptrap of a modern state. Mm -hmm. Until you ask the question why is there this opposition to be considered a citizen of India? Ripan Babu did not say very much. He gave me the party line. I got the answer from a, a tribal Tripura person. The answer is like this. We were a happy people in our own homeland. Then comes the partition of India. All these other people come, the Bengalis. And then there is 1971, more Bengalis. Now, in a state where we were 100%, we are now a tiny minority pushed into the interior areas. And then we start the second problem. There are the Bengalis. But does that mean non-Bengalis are a people? They are not a people because they can't talk to one another in one language. Every valley has a language of its own. And when it comes to writing, they are not written languages. They have adopted um, the Roman alphabet. But those tribes which have been Christianized are taking to it much more vigorously than the others who are falling back on Bengali. So when you think of tiny Tripura, Catherine, you're absolutely right. It's not a center state issue. It's an issue of self 
against the other self, against the other self, and the other, real other, is way back in Delhi. Mm -hmm. So the question that I would happily join in with is, if federalism is about self-rule balanced with, um, what is it, self-rule and the other rule, if that is the essence of federalism, then who is the self and who is the other? Is this a daily Northeast problem or a problem of distinct ethnic groups packed into very different political territories? And short of ethnic cleansing, which is not politically correct, and short of pulverization, which is not the Indian way, it's not the melting pot, but the salad bowl kind of federalism. What is the solution? Well, you know, uh, well, a couple of things. Um, uh, well, I would say that I, I sort of hesitate to, to have the model of ethnic federalism to Northeast India because I think it's not that. I really think the specificity of Northeast India having customary law, the fact that it, they are ethnic homelands makes it very different. Tamil Nadu is Tamil, West Bengal is Bengal, Assam is Assam, but in a very different sense than Nagaland is Naga or Mizoram is Mizo. The senses are not the same at all, right? And so that whole ethnic homeland uh, idea is uh, almost accidental, not because it was intended, partly goes back to colonial times and not enough thinking. That's why I call decolonizing space. It really goes back to the idea, you know, you have colonial uh, ethnography has words like Kachanaga. Kachanaga, why does the word have Kachanaga? Real Nagas live there, these are false Nagas. They really have such racist notions you won't believe it. And it just suited to political economy of 19th century T to say that, you know, have administration here, not over there. Right? Not over there. And those areas were not only the territory or exterior of capital, as Bodhisattva Kaur says, they are the tempo temporal exterior of capital. So to think that these problems can simply be addressed by, you know, their territorial federalism will be really to miss a lot, right? So then once you consider that, then then it is not so much, look, one can make a huge deal out of North East India's difference. I don't think North East India is that, that different or that, that many differences because these are in a way the function of fictions. I can say 200 languages, 500 languages, 800 languages. Minal Miri, a very distinguished philosopher, he has a lovely saying. He said languages live so close to each other in North East India that many people grow up as naturally multilingual beings, right? So in some ways, one can't really make too much out of this diversity either, right? So there are pos political possibilities, citizenship are about all of that, right? We never tried them, right? And we never tried them, only model we have doesn't, doesn't come from there. It is not as if they, can have, uh, they come from somewhere else, from colonial thing and Indian states thing, creating ethnic homelands only. So we use the ethnic homeland idea to solve problems, and ethnic homeland becomes the only way of imagining liberation, right? And how do you undo this? Uh, that to me is the main issue. These people are not naturally kind of look, looking for ethnic homelands. Right? Unless we have a theory that this area is so unique in the world, right? we have to understand why is it. Right? I don't think that can, we can have a theory like that is so unique. right? So in a way, I would say the political imagination is shaped by these institutions. right? And that is where I so So, so in that sense then, in terms of your center state, interstate, I think I, I don't know, go there because I really don't think these are states in the same sense. You know, I really think my whole, there I will stick to my cosmetic federalism idea. They, they look like states, they're not states, right? So in that sense then, uh, my argument in cosmetic federalism was that, you know, in a way, say that who is chief minister doesn't very much, matter very much. Who is governor matters much more. Governor is running the show from, home, the, from, from New Delhi, right? So in that sense, it is not kind of a, a center state because they're not states, <laughs> right? I will be my polemical argument. Okay, um, we don't have that much time, and I see that there's two hands. I think it's a good idea to uh, collect uh, any remaining questions. So the order I have so far is we have three. Ramajar, Maliji, and Sundarbha. Uh, oh, yeah, a very quick question about the engagement of the you know, different insurgent groups with the Indian constitution and some of the articles uh -huh. came up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And if you recall from the Pankaj Butalia film that yeah. some of us saw, right. there were sort of in, 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 you know, insurgent groups yeah, leading yeah. out. No, we all recall the yeah. uh -huh. So is there a sense that, you know, uh, that in some senses they have a faith in the constitution, mm -hmm. in the sense that the constitution is something that is, see is, is above and beyond the state, in a uh -huh. sense 
that it is a document that the Indian state does not adhere to, uh -huh. but in some senses provides recourse uh -huh. provisions for you know, some space uh -huh. for, for the demands of these uh, insurgent groups, uh -huh. which is sort of different from the way the Indian state in practice functions. Uh -huh. So we'll take this. I have a very quick question for you also as a political theorist and a political scientist. Mm -hmm. Uh, and my question is in regions where Can territory. You okay. So, my question is in regions where territory and ethnicities don't neatly coincide, mm -hmm. what is a durable political form? Mm -hmm. Durable disorder. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Just a very quick question. This question of boundary production, right? How we produce boundaries. boundaries yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah. IR coincides oh, very with nice, yeah, 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 yeah. boundary mm -hmm. production. Mm -hmm. One, is there another way to for these narratives to happen? I think one problem is that there's a very monolithic idea of the center, mm -hmm. the state. Right. If you look at how the contemporary Indian state, and I, again, I, different parts of the Indian state act, mm -hmm. one problem is that there is no monolithic Indian state. There's no single mm -hmm. state. There are different organs of the Indian state right. which jostle mm -hmm. and then produce outcomes that become suboptimal. Mm -hmm. I, I just give you a mm -hmm. small example. Mm -hmm. This whole thing about Lukis, mm -hmm. right, and the boundaries and connecting to Southeast Asia. Parts of the Indian state thinks a good thing, obviously. Right. The MEA thinks it's a good thing. Good thing yeah. uh, the people on the trade side probably think it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. The security services th don't think it's a good mm -hmm. thing. And this mm -hmm. jostling then, yeah. and maybe sometimes we miss out mm -hmm. the narrative here because we all talking about the state, the yeah, Indian yeah. state, the center. Maybe the, yeah. you know, we miss out part yeah. of the narrative. I just thought maybe one comments on that. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, fitting last question. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit on what you find peculiar about the relationship between what you call India and the Northeast, but actually you're talking about the center, Delhi and the mm -hmm. Northeast. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the sort of model of the state that we've been discussing this, uh, this last hour um, of an, an ethnic unit with borders around it has been tried forever and doesn't exist. Right. I think, well, perhaps, no, not even Vatican City would. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, if you look at this sort of the, the, the 19th century laboratory uh, of national unity and mm -hmm. self-determination and so on, Europe, mm -hmm. you see that these states are, they, some of them have established a, a sort of a balance between different ethnic groups for a while. Right. But look at Britain and the Scots, okay. look at Spain and the Catalans right. at the moment, look at many other European right. countries. Right. It's mm -hmm. clearly a phase that mm -hmm. is uh, sort of fading. Um, so maybe you should think of India and the Northeast as Britain and Scotland, mm -hmm. where you know, you're trying to deal with maybe a very complicated Scotland. Um, but um, this is something that is, um, I mean, the idea that you will solve the problem and turn them all into Indians, uh -huh. or the idea that you will, that they will get away and become oh. something else, right. is not very helpful, I, I think. Agree with you. Yeah. Number of questions. No, look, I think I, I will, um, let's see, I won't just, since uh, William just asked, no, in a way that my uh, conclusion, as you know, with the, I relate ultimately to the crisis of the nation form. My conclusion is very <coughs> similar to what you are saying. I suppose the peculiar is simply my way of opening up and not really not sticking to old discourse of you know solving the insurgency, not solving the insurgency, pro solving this problem, that solving problem. I'm just looking a, for a way out of thinking like that, right? And listing this, peculiarly look at just a kind of tentative term, uh, so I've called reflection of peculiar relations, allows me to even just raise thing. It came from nowhere. Doesn't really come from nowhere, but still nobody expected it. So now all these are make it a little interesting if you put it all together. So I, I won't insist on the word peculiar, but it's just a way of opening up the conversation, right? But and uh, your conclusions say after all, even to think about it as UK and Scotland, 
you know, Catalonia's problem is Spain doesn't agree Catalonia's uh, plebiscite is, is legitimate. Britain thinks Scotland is legitimate. You still need order to say it's okay to do this. Ulfa will completely agree with you. Let's think like Scotland. <laughs> Let's have plebiscites. Indian state as we agree. So that wouldn't take us very far, right? So the fact that legitim whatever political order has to agree on those things, still we are stuck with this issue, if you like. But, uh, but we don't disagree on the, on the uh, basic uh, point you are making. On uh, border, I completely agree with you. So in a way, we didn't directly get into it. But when we talked about Loki's policy, the fact that, um, uh, that Indian... Uh, within uh, Indian security doesn't like all that. That uh, yeah, I think it can easily frame then your formulate better way of formulating it. Why why even use a language that the state is the same thing? I have no problem with that. Yeah, so it is not after all one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing, which is why we have this mess, <laughs> right? In fact, when probably they thought they're solving Northeast by doing reorganization, the Home Ministry they did some other ministries didn't even know, right? So so in a way your point can be extended to what I'm saying. No intellectual energy went into it. Right? But it's also an extension of your securitization. Securitization. They have, yeah. a decisive they have a decisive power, right? That's true, yeah. So on uh, Malini's point, look, I, I think that I really don't even st start with the assumption that ethnicity is something always there, right? So if it's not always there, after all, we, uh, as a result, ethnicity itself is, becomes a particular construction under particular conditions, right? So then the fact of whether if you have so many ethnic groups and how does territory correspond with it, it doesn't strike me as big a problem, right? In the sense that after all, uh, just the way other ethnic territories are not organized on ethnic lines, citizenship in a way one can say, civic is very different from ethnic. There's no reason why these units can't have more civic elements in the, in the configuration. My, my criticism of the, of the 1971 ethnic homeland settlement would be, we know lots of people are there who wouldn't be from that majority group, all right. Why don't we build into it as some notion that gradually settlers will become citizens? Maybe after three generations, 10 generations, but a notion should be there instead of making them permanent outsiders, right? So in some way, I mean, there's nothing, in, nothing kind of a, inherent about these ethnic settlements that our political solution have to be within those terms. Because of lack of political imagination, we never thought the implication of ethnic homeland, right? And ethnic homeland has become the only model, but it's easily, I have suggested it about in an article I wrote a long time ago, the ethnic homeland article, that if you think in citizenship terms, essentially Northeast Indian states, every non-person, a person who doesn't qualify into those ethnic categories are permanent outsiders no matter how many generations you live there. All the voting uh, arrangement, right? You actually there, they, people don't have votes either. Do you want that to be a permanent arrangement? Do you think it will work permanently? I don't think so. That involves bringing in the civic element, which we never did. Then on the Indian Constitution's faith, Rano Joy, it is, you know, it is so opportunistic. So I think I will ha I hesitate to think of his faith, right? You're constantly looking for arguments. Why can't we be like Nagaland? Ah, our Constitution says this. We can be, right? So there's really a kind of a you, you'll be amazed by the kind of a opportunistic use of constitutional documents, right? Just to make an argument rather than anything else. Certainly not constitutional faith will be, you know, will be <laughs> too much. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll stop there. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure listening to this stimulating debate. I would like to thank Professor Sanjeev Barua for engaging us Professor Prashant Jitwara for being so extremely moderate in his moderation, <laughs> and for all of you uh, for the questions you have asked. Now, ISAS is a think tank, and uh, our job is to think, and not just tank it, but uh, <laughs> publish it. And uh, our editor, Surya Narayan, is always happy to um, get submissions and to put them out. Why is this important? Why does why does this matter? I'm still relatively new to Singapore, and I'm trying to understand why are the ministries, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade and Industry, investing so heavily in ISAS? I mean, what is in it for them? After all, it's not, we don't uh, depend on the NUS for our funds. This is something I've been thinking about and asking ministries about, and listening to you, I. Uh, I think I'm, I'm beginning to get the answer. I mean, what holds Singapore together? Why does Singapore not have a little problem of ethnic conflict, or does it? 
if you ask the question this way, you would see how quickly you run out of conventional answers. Mm. Take Catherine's question. I mean, we have been talking about it since our time in Hull. Dif diversity, no problem. Identify the diversities and give them bits of power so that they can balance self-rule with shared rule, provided the diversities are packed into uh, distinctive areas. What happens if some diversities are thinly distributed over the whole area? No problem. Identify the thinly distributed diverse element and have a top slice. Give it to them. That's called um, consociational consociationalism. Combine consociationalism and federalism, you get an article into the APSR. That's life art. That's all very nice. The issue here is, it's not a question of self-rule and shared rule. It's not at all clear who is the self. And what do we do with the many selves who have to be packed into a very small area? A think tank like ours has to go beyond conventional ideas and think of something fresh, something entangled. Is it capitalism? Flood them with very high standard of living and very high-rise um, high buildings, and they would all feel citizens? Or pulverize them in an authoritarian way? Or go out to win their hearts and minds through citizenship training and education? All of it, some of it, none of it. Now, that is the kind of thinking that is expected to emerge from ISAS, which is why we start with very simple ideas of democracy, which is power sharing and conversation within a society, diplomacy, which is conversation between societies, replacing war with peace, and drawing on both to find a way from here to there, disorder to order, and so on, which is why we have here economists, political scientists, IR specialists who work together in a body like this, and conversations like this are terribly important for us. You have shown a way, Prasenjit, in terms of the culture of conversation you brought us in Singapore and institutionalized at the ARI. And we know that we are going to lose you soon, but I hope what you have produced as a legacy will stay on. And from ISAS, we are always happy to pull together all the elements within NUS who are interested in South Asia and comparative studies and have conversations like this. Now, now that you have gotten us started, we can't let you go empty-handed, no. so we have got a gift for you, and this is a book. The title is Connecting India to ASEAN, Opportunities and Challenges in India's Northeast, edited by Dr. Narayan and our Lal Dikina, Dikima Silo. Mm -hmm. So on behalf of ISAS and all my colleagues, thank you very much for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Exhausting but very nice.